sign language? Uh-uh. That's all I know. All right. Good evening. Sorry for the delay for those who are online. Uh, I'm just going to open in prayer, share a couple things real quick, open in prayer and turn it over to Andrew. Uh, I was asked this afternoon about masks on Sunday. Um, we do, our county is under a mask mandate. We do have to wear masks on Sunday in and out of the building. If you have a medical reason why you cannot wear a mask, Please sit in one of the outside sections uh, the way we were doing, I don't know, a few months back before they lifted the mask mandate. So this section to my right has been masked only. Now it's unmasked. And uh, if you're confused, we all are, it's okay. So uh, let's open in prayer. And, and yes, we will be singing Sunday, uh, even though we, we'll be doing it with masks on, but we will be singing. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for being so good to us. I thank you for Andrew teaching this class. I pray, God, that you would bless him, use him, bless Brother Morgan as he's teaching the other class on uh, finances. We pray, God, that you'd bless us. And Lord, we're dealing with uh, inconvenience, with masks and, and just going back and forth. We're all tired of it, but God, your grace is sufficient to see us through. So help us, God, to deal with whatever we have to. Bless us. We do pray for those in our church that are recovering from COVID. Uh, Pastor Chuck is doing much better. We praise you for that. We think about the, the Rose family, the Apperson family, the Mashad family. And God, there may be one or two more. I'm not even sure. There's just a number of people dealing with it. We pray that they would all heal quickly, be able to be back here very soon. We just thank you and praise you for all this now. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to make sure I'm able to... Good evening, church. Good evening. I want to welcome you tonight. I'd ask you to, if you would, open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 1. And if you would, out of respect for the reading of God's Word, if you'd uh, stand with me. And I'm going to begin in verse 15. I'm going to read through verse 25 of Romans chapter 1. Hear the Word of God. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And while you're standing, if you would uh, join me in prayer. Father God, we love you this evening, and we praise your holy name. We praise your power and your might that you are the one and only living and true God, and we confess your worth, Father, this evening. I pray that you just uh, 
bless this series, bless this evening. I pray that through it, souls be saved and Christians drawn closer to you, that we might be able to defend our faith more boldly and honor you. Father God, I pray these things through the name and the blood of your Son, our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you. You may be seated. Well, first of all, I want to thank you folks for uh, being here tonight, uh, those of you here in person and those of you watching online, listening online, perhaps you're watching or listening at a later date to a recording of this. Um, but I'm really going to go into the who, what, where, when, why, and how of apologetics, okay? Uh, let me ask you a question first of all. Have you ever felt unequipped to answer a question from the unbeliever when sharing your faith? Or have you ever felt unprepared to handle objections or how to respond to objections to your faith? And because of that, is that holding you back from witnessing? Uh, is it keeping you from having boldness and confidence in sharing the gospel of Christ and leading souls to him? Well, throughout this series, I want to share with you a Christ-centered, God-honoring, biblical apologetic that hopefully will simplify things for you and help you to respond to some of these objections and be able to uh, have a winsome witness in uh, leading souls to Christ. I've entitled this series, No Apologies, okay? This is a biblical study in Christian apologetics. Now, first of all, what does that word mean, apologetics? Does that mean we go around saying we're sorry and apologizing for our faith or making excuses or excusing our faith? Well, it comes from the Greek originally, apologia, and uh, the Latin is apologia, same word really. But to define those words, Merriam-Webster calls it a defense, especially of one's opinions, position, or actions. If you consider dictionary.com, it's an apology, as in a defense or justification of a belief or an idea, etc. Now, in literature, it would be a work written as an explanation or justification of one's motives, convictions, or acts. So how does that word apologia relate to apologetics, the field and the study itself? Well, if you look up uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary, Apologetics is a study of defending by words or arguments, excusing, said or written in defense or by way of apology as an apologetic essay. Um, Dictionary.com says it's the branch of theology concerned with the defense or proof of Christianity. Google calls it reasoned arguments or writings in justification of something, typically a theory or religious doctrine, and it gives as an example in quotes, free market apologetics. Um, subsequently, it's a systematic argumentative discourse in defense as of a doctrine. And lastly, a branch of theology devoted to the defense of the divine origin and authority of Christianity. You know, one thing I noticed is very curious about all these different definitions. Apologetics is defined broadly regarding almost any general belief opinion system as that uh, example Google gave in economics. But in actual use, it's almost exclusively applied to religion. And to go furthermore, it's almost exclusively applied to the defense of the Christian faith. So I thought that was uh, very interesting to find. Now, I want to share that this is related to evangelism, witnessing, soul winning, but yet it's still distinct because apologetics deals with the answering of questions and the response to objections to your faith. See, because there's a difference between sharing your faith and defending your faith. It's one thing to share your faith, but we, when you begin to get questions that are less sincere, okay, or objections outright to the existence of God and the truth of his word, 
Now I'm no longer in sharing my faith mode, and I'm in defending my faith mode. Well, if apologetics is the field of defending the Christian faith, let me ask you out there right now, first of all, just by show of hands, do you think that it needs defending? In other words, does it need a good defense? Or is it in need of defending? Okay, I see a hand there. I heard one apologist ask that to, uh, uh, to an unbeliever. Um, let me ask you to share on the screen there, Matthew 16, 18. I'll quickly turn there. Matthew 16, 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I've really only learned that through the teaching and preaching of this church that, you know, I overlooked the idea that a gate is a defensive construct, okay? It's constructed against an attack. Now, I want to challenge your thinking about this a little bit. And when I ask you whether it uh, needs defending or not, let me ask if this makes sense to you. Does it make sense to you that the all-powerful God of the universe would need you to defend him? Think about that for a moment now. You know, it reminds me of a, of a conversation I had with an unbeliever who charged me with the accusation that all we're out for is, is his money. And uh, I was no longer in sharing my faith mode. I was in defending my faith mode. And it was a very, you know, uh, vitriolic uh, attack. To which I replied, if my church really needed money, would I really be coming to you? Wouldn't we really be sitting down at a bank uh, for, for, for money? But I would argue that the church is under great attack, but also it's largely the faith is rejected, it's dismissed, it's ignored out there in the world. Let me tell you how this uh, series came about. This started back in May. Give you a little background here on a leadership meeting in Zoom. And the uh, pastor was talking about having different training sessions on Wednesday nights. Now, I remember Debbie Lawson making a comment that she was interested in evangelism and witnessing, soul winning. I'm not sure if she used all those words or even apologetics, but I couldn't stop thinking about that throughout the, the whole meeting. And the reason is because over the past few years, and especially over the lockdown in particular, I've spent a lot of time reading and watching and listening to apologetics. Um, in years past, one man from this church gave me a, a Bible or a commentary by Dr. Henry Morse, who is a large proponent of the literal, literal account of creation in Genesis. Later on, a man in this church turned me on to Answers in Genesis, uh, to Ken Ham and his ministry. And it really bolstered my faith regarding the literal account of creation, and it steered me back to biblical authority. A few years ago, I would uh, sit in the library while uh, Donna was in uh, choir practice, and often I would look at books there and study for my next uh, Sunday school lesson. And I came across a book in, in there titled The Ultimate Proof of Creation. And I'll share it with you now. It's by a gentleman named Dr. Jason Lyle. He's a PhD astrophysicist out of the University of Colorado. He's had a relationship with Answers in Genesis and the Institute for Creation Research. And I read through that book voraciously and I was excited about it. And it really uh, revolutionized my apologetic. Since then, I've watched videos of his. And from watching those videos, it, it has led me to other videos, other different uh, speakers and authors. And I would cite a few of those now, Cornelius Van Til, Greg Bonson, Cy Tenbergenkate, Gene Cook, Paul Vigiano, Jeff Durbin. I found that a number of these apologists are of a reformed 
theological tradition. I confess a lack of understanding of that. We would differ with them theologically on some things. Uh, some of them are Calvinist. Uh, one at least is a Baptist. But I never saw how the apologetic, the argument, how their theology affected the argument. And I could not find a flaw in their argument, okay? Presented by Jason Lyle, for example, in uh, The Ultimate Proof of Creation. And I literally have a hundred hours of video and podcasts and Google Hangouts, sermons and lectures and debates, radio and television interviews, uh, open air preaching and Skype interviews, just stuck in my head because it was such a, a revolutionary idea and it really revolutionized uh, my apologetic. And through that, I've learned many of the responses and answers to these questions and objections of the unbeliever. And one thing we were talking about in this Zoom meeting is the church was getting ready to reopen. We wanted to see how things were going to look like in the fall. And essentially, you could wipe the slate clean and do anything you wanted to do. If, if you were going to make a change, then now would be the time to make it. And we questioned each other why there was such an ambivalence ambivalence out there in the world to faith. Pastor preached on it Sunday that we've gone through a worldwide pandemic and repentance has not come to this country. And I thought a minute, and I thought for a reason why there's such ambivalence to faith out there. I think that there's an idea out there in the world that this is just a belief that we hold, that it's not necessarily true, that it's just simply an arbitrary belief that we hold and that it's really equivalent to a lot of other activities which people are conducting even right now. That it's uh, no better or no worse. One man told me years ago that I'm just living life the religious way. He told me that we do it for the camaraderie. Well, you know, there's people in a bowling alley tonight with a, silk sh with a, a name on their silk shirt and they're, they're uh, bowling in a league. You know, on Saturday they'll be playing softball. And there's camaraderie in that. But that's not the reason why we do it. We do enjoy fellowship, but that's not the reason uh, why we assemble. You know, they say out there in the world that faith is just a crutch, that uh, it's something that helps us get through the day, that it helps us to sleep at night. So if I were to ask you tonight, why are you a Christian? I might get many different answers in here. And a lot of them would, uh, would be true. But I was challenged by that question myself. And I've come to the position of uh, some other apologists in saying that that really encapsulates two sub-questions within it. The first is, what is the reason why you're a Christian? And the second is, what is the cause of you becoming a Christian? Now, of course, the cause of me becoming a Christian is that God saved me, right? God took out our heart of stone and gave us a heart of flesh. But the reason why I'm a Christian is because it is true, that it is objectively true, that God exists and his word is true. Well, not long after that uh, Zoom meeting, Christopher called me, asked me to teach. I told him I really only had about an hour of material, maybe two at the most, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to pray about it, think about it. And uh, really right there on the phone call, I said, no, I, I know I'm supposed to do this. Um, and we both decided that maybe I could expand on that hour I had. So I'm going to try to cram an hour's worth of material into six weeks. So now I'm going to ask you to begin reciting a verse for me, okay? And for you in the sound booth, I'm going to ask you not to put it up on the screen yet. There's a reason for that. Don't, don't give me the address, but if you could just start reciting what you think is the most famous verse in apologetics. What is the... God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay, I've got... I've got John 3.16. What I'm seeking is the charter verse 
for the field of apologetics. Well, that's actually very good. I have Genesis 1-1 here, too. Okay. Pastor said, be ready to give an answer. Okay. And we can go ahead and put it up there. 1 Peter 3.15. Okay. We'll go ahead and uh, turn there. First Peter 3.15, you know, before I read this, I want to point out there are so many verses in the Bible which are either commonly misinterpreted or there are things that we have thought were in there and aren't. I've learned a lot of that, you know, from pastor. There are, uh, we recite a lot of half verses. And if you notice this, if I had asked any of you to recite 1 Peter 3.15, we all might have started with always be ready to give an answer. But a lot of times we miss the first part of that verse, which reads as follows. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now I'll share with you later why that is so important. Um, But for tonight... Much of this is going to be way by way of introductory material tonight. Uh, So I'm going to ask you to sit back and relax. I want you to hang with me and just bear with me tonight. I'm going to tease you a little bit and string you along. I want to have, have you hanging on the edge of your seat. But first of all, I've always thought it was important that whenever anyone is speaking to you, that you know something about their background and history, their experiences, so that you know their perspective and the angle from which they approach this particular subject. So I'm going to share with you first a brief biography, and then I'm going to follow with a longer testimony. My goal is to share with you how apologetics played a role in my conversion, how it subsequently played a role in my walk, and now how it is playing a role in my witness. So I'm going to interweave this with a lot of real-life practical examples in apologetics and hopefully it will be meaningful to you because that's where I live uh, on the practical side of things. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrew Buckingham and it has been for 52 years. Uh, So I was born in Washington, D.C. back in uh, 69. I'm the eldest of two. I have a younger sister but my sister only has one brother and no sisters. Some of y'all will get that on the way home. But uh, I'm from here. I was born in D.C. I was raised in the Prince George's County suburbs, uh, mailing address originally Silver Hill, later Suitland. But really, my neighborhood is right in between Camp Springs, Marlowe Heights, Oxon Hill, uh, Clinton, So I'm from right around here. And so I like to point out that actually I do have an older brother in a in a setting like this. I have an older brother in heaven. You know, among people here who believe that life begins at conception, I like to call to remembrance sometimes. My mom, you know, lost one in miscarriage in sixty seven, and so I look forward to seeing an older brother in heaven. But I'm born to a father who was born in nineteen twenty. I'm 52, I'm the oldest, and I have a father who would be 100 today. It's like being raised by grandparents. It's very different. Born in Bellevue, Ohio, raised in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He grew up in the Depression. We don't think he ever went past the eighth grade as far as education because we think he had to go to work. He went and enlisted in the Navy, became a petty officer second class. He was on the aircraft carriers in the Pacific. He was an aircraft deck mechanic, second class. And he fought in World War II in Korea. Interestingly enough, my father shipped out of Pearl Harbor on December 6th, 1941, the day before the attack. And no doubt, they had to return. And uh, so subsequently, after retiring from the Navy, he would drive trucks for different companies. He eventually became an owner-operator. Now, 
my parents rarely talked about religion amongst themselves in the house, except when they would get in an argument, my father would call my mother an Irish Catholic, so-and-so. But we think my father was raised Methodist or of some Protestant background. And what's interesting is that my father knew some Bible in a way that I and my mother and sister didn't. You know, I was never encouraged to memorize Bible verses growing up in church or in school. You know, my father rarely attended services with us except on Christmas and Easter, but we loved it when he did because he had a voice, a beautiful voice that would just boom over the whole congregation and we would love to hear him sing. The problem was, because he only attended on Christmas and Easter, is he didn't know the words. And we would have to feed him the lyrics. You know, for example, on Easter, he would be singing, Christ the Lord is risen today, and in the very next breath, glory to the newborn king. So that was rather amusing. But we, we were glad when he came with us. He was not a formally educated man, but he was rather self-educated. I can hear him even now stirring his coffee in the morning and voraciously reading the paper. He retired uh, from owning and operating trucks. He had owned multiple trucks and trailers, and he went to work uh, driving trucks for someone else, driving a straight truck for a small company. And uh, I remember in college at university, one Thursday night I got a call from my mom. She was crying that my father had been diagnosed with lung cancer and emphysema, and they were awaiting the prognosis. Now, as it turns out, I was in Air Force ROTC, and I was about to take a trip the very next day to Joint Base Andrews. They called it Andrews Air Force Base back then. My mother and father drove and met us on base at the bus. And as I walked up to my father, I could see him crying because I'm walking up in my Air Force ROTC uniform I put my hand on his hand, and he puts his other hand on mine, and I just knew. You know, he was diagnosed to live uh, six months to a year. He wound up living a year and a half. And uh, I came home and worked nights. My, my mother worked days, and we took care of my father. One night that was very unusual, I came home early, which I never did. And my mom stayed up late, which she never did. And Dad was having a bad night. And he had gotten up to go to the bathroom, and we heard him fall in the bathroom. And I tried to help him up, get him onto the bed, and Mom went to uh, call the ambulance. We got him up and conscious and talking, and the paramedics were tending to him. But all Dad wanted to do was just to go to the bathroom. And I remember him saying, Bubba, can you help me up? And as I tried to help Dad up, it must have been just too much for him, too much for his heart. He must have just had a massive heart attack and I felt him let go. And so, there he died in my arms. My mom was born in 34, born in Kansas, raised in uh, Iowa. They moved to Iowa when, when she was three. Her father was a machinist for John Deere, and her mother was a wife and a homemaker. She was raised as a strict Catholic. She attended Sacred Heart Church and school. She was recruited straight out of her senior year into the Hoover FBI. The recruiters had come to her school when she was 18 years old, and she went straight off to work for the FBI, and she worked there 10 years. You know, my sister and I often uh, quip that we think my mom was an FBI interrogator because you could not get away with anything. The way that she would frame a question had you tied in knots before you knew it. She could tie you into a pretzel that way. But uh, my mom later on went to become a personal secretary for Senators Fong and Hayakawa, Senator Fong from Hawaii and Hayakawa from California. She went on diplomatic missions throughout the world, through Asia. And uh, I remember our entire basement was filled with file cabinets full of steno notepads and shorthand. My sister and I said that we held the secrets of the world in, in our basement. But she was a... She earned an associate's degree from Strayer Business College, and she was skilled as a, uh, in dictation and shorthand and as a typist, supervised a room full of 25 other secretaries. And so 
In our formative years, my mom quit work and came home to raise us. Before that, we were being raised by, effectively, we didn't know it, but a nanny, really just a friend of the family, a nice little old lady. And uh, she came home to raise us, and later on she went back to work, but the world had changed. You know, she had been skilled on a $1,100 IBM Selectric typewriter, and now she had to learn a computer. But she learned WordPerfect, and she learned the computer and worked some years later until she retired. And then she moved to Newcastle, PA, with my sister and brother-in-law and the two kids, helped raise the grandkids, and enjoyed her senior years until she passed away in 2015. Now I'd like to share with you uh, my own personal testimony. That's a little bit of, of background and uh, share with you, practically speaking, how apologetics played a role in my life. Well, my sister and I were raised strict Catholic by my mother, and we went to a primary school, a Catholic school, and in that Catholic school, I would learn one thing in religion class. I would learn the Genesis account of creation. I would learn the same thing in CCD class, and I didn't question it. And each class attended a daily mass one day of the week. And I remember specifically sitting on the front pew, kneeling down in my kneeler, praying a prayer which I had recited by rote many times before, and attempting to impute meaning into this prayer. And for some reason, it rang hollow and empty. And that made a difference to me. And I tucked that away in the back of my mind. You know, there's a difference between saying a prayer and praying. And I didn't understand that back then. But uh, turn with me to uh, Matthew 6, 7, if you would. Share a quick verse of Scripture in Matthew 6, 7. I learned this much later. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. But I hadn't heard that, and I didn't understand that then. So in that school and in that church, I was baptized, catechized, simonized, as Pastor Dave used to say. I took my first communion not discerning the Lord's body, as the scripture states. I didn't understand that back then. I was an altar boy. I wore the, the frock and the vestments. I would hold the book for the priest. I would swing the incense. Incidentally, you know that book I held for the priest? That's not a Bible. You know, you walk into a Catholic church and there's nary a Bible to be found, okay? It's essentially a program, okay, a script, a liturgy, it's the liturgy of the Mass. And there's missalettes all throughout the pews. And it's a program. I didn't understand that. But uh, then I was sent to a private college preparatory school for boys. It's run by the English Benedictine monks. It's uh, grades 6 through 12. We call it Form 1 through 6. It's a very strict, rigorous academic environment. But in religion class, I would learn one thing, okay, this same account of creation, and then I would walk over to earth science class and learn something different. I would learn about billions of years. I would read in scripture class that same account of creation in Genesis, but then I would go to world history class, or ancient history perhaps, or biology class, and learn about evolution. And I would try to reconcile these things in my own mind. And the best way I thought to do it was I would have to allegorize the account of creation in Genesis. But I was doing so really without basis. Now there's in-house debates within the realm of Christendom, within Christian circles out there. There's ideas such as the day-age theory and the Bible states the, that a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. 
There's ideas such as the gap theory, that there's a gap of time, say, between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, other places. But I didn't buy that. I thought it was either one or the other. But it was the only way I could really reconcile this in my own head. Then I would go to church history class and learn about Anselm's ontological argument for the, history, for the, for the existence of God. Essentially, the definition is God is that being than which none greater can exist. But I was told that you can't ever prove God because I cannot show you very God. I cannot show you him physically. So I was taught that I cannot prove God. I can only demonstrate him. And that piqued my curiosity because although I was not saved, I have never known of a time in my life when I did not know of the existence of God. I have never known of a time in life when I did not profess my belief in God. You see, Satan believes God exists. That's not doing him any good. So, that planted the seed in my mind, and I remained unconvinced from that day forward that you really couldn't prove the existence of God. So, let me ask you this question. Does it make sense to you that the all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present God of the universe would leave us without a proof of his existence? That doesn't make sense to me. And yet I, I wasn't aware of one. I couldn't find one. So, Turn with me to uh, Luke 21.15. Share with you a passage of Scripture in Luke 21.15. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. We have the words of eternal life here. Now, I realize it's almost sacrilegious for a bookbinder to be scrolling through uh, verses on a screen, but uh, simply for time's sake, I beg your pardon. So, I would ask myself, how is it possible that another could not know something which I seem to know innately, which was simply built in? You know, if you go buy a computer today, it comes prepackaged with Windows. It comes with an operating system already loaded into it. You need that operating system in order to install more software and apps. If they just sold you a piece of hardware with no operating system in it, you could not do a thing with it. So that's my analogy there. But uh, I would go on through prep school, and I I went through confirmation. It's a Catholic rite of passage for young adults. Um, I remember very specific instances in my upbringing that spoke volumes to me. I remember going to my neighbor's house, to his door on Halloween. See, as Catholics... We celebrated Halloween. We even celebrated school and church. We would dress up. I probably went far too long in my teen years celebrating Halloween. But I showed up at my neighbor's door, and there's a sign on the door, this house is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, or words to that effect. Okay, we don't celebrate Halloween here. Okay, this house belongs to Jesus Christ. And that made an impression upon me, because these were new neighbors, I didn't know them very well. I didn't understand their theology, but I understood that they were serious about their faith, that this was not just a casual church on Sunday social gathering. This was not just coffee and donuts, but they took this seriously. Well, I remember I was open to other faiths because I always wanted to learn about other faiths. And I was invited by a friend of mine to stay the night over at his house and I attended his service with him. He was a Mormon. 
I attended the service. I went to a, a dance with him the, the night before. It's funny, I got to dancing too close to the girl and they slipped a Bible in between us. I had heard about that. I'd never seen that. I didn't understand that. But uh, I didn't understand his Mormonism, but I understood that he was serious about this belief system, that he would go on in his, uh, in his later years on a pilgrimage that they, that they all went on. So after prep school, I began to attend a Catholic church when I went to university. I attended with my roommate. I think it's St. Paul's there in Pittsburgh. But I quickly fell away, and I really didn't pursue uh, my Catholic religion in college. And then I remember walking across the cut on campus one day and seeing all these signs across campus that said, Cliff is coming. C-L-I-F-F-E, Cliff is coming. And so it wasn't long after when I would walk across the campus and see a gathering off in the distance, up by the fence, a famous fence under a specific tree, and there was a crowd gathered. So I went up to see what was going on, and there was a curly-headed man, tall, thin guy, with a microphone and a speaker, and he was preaching, and he had drawn a crowd, and he was getting heckled. And mind you, I had never been in a secular setting before. And I, I had not heard heckling like this before, really vitriolic things. He was getting some sincere questions and some legitimate ob objections, but he was also getting he heckled. I looked him up uh, not long ago. His name is Cliff Nectel, K-N-E-C-H-T-L-E, Cliff Nectel. You'll see him on the, on the internet. But uh, later on, I approached him. He came at another time to our effectively our student union, our Skibo Hall, which is a student union hall. And the same thing happened. But as I would listen to him, one thing I noticed was that this man was sincere about his faith, that he really meant what he was saying. And I heard preaching like I had never heard before. And I didn't really understand it totally, but I, I had sympathy with him and I had some agreement with him, and I approached him afterwards. It's rather amusing to me looking back on this now because I approached him afterwards and discussed some areas of agreement, not even realizing that we were separated, that he was a Christian and that I was not. See, I thought that he was just some other denomination of Christianity, but his sincerity really made an impression upon me. And uh, he must have been invited by one of the Christian groups on campus, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship or Campus Crusade for Christ or Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I approached some of those people from one of these groups, and I attended several of their Bible studies. I went with uh, a girlfriend I had in college, and we attended several of those Bible studies, never the while realizing that I was yet unsaved, that they were Christians and I was not, that there was a decision to be made. And one interesting thing about uh, my relationship with my girlfriend in college, wonderful lady, but she was Baptist or Protestant of some sort. I never really understood exactly which, but I could ask her questions, and I didn't understand certain things about people lifting up hands in church, and she would talk about people getting happy in church and others needing to attend to them, and I didn't understand that sort of thing. But she never really did witness to me. I was Catholic, but she never really did witness to me, and I think perhaps the ladies sometimes don't want to make waves, and it's a very uh, dangerous thing to become unequally yoked, you know, with unbelievers, and uh, we need to guard that with our, our young people. Anyway, 
We parted amicably, and I went on unsaved. But the Lord began drawing me to him around my 25th birthday. I remember on my 25th birthday, a friend of mine had bought a book for me. We were both always looking at different business opportunities. We wanted to start a band and then a music magazine and this, that, and the other. But he bought a book for me on real estate. And I read that book, and I thought, thought it curious that the author interwove spiritual principles within this business book. Now, I'd never heard that sort of thing before. I didn't really understand that. But I thought it was interesting. But my friend and I were always looking at different sort of business opportunities. And his parents had gotten tickets to a conference down in D.C. at the convention center. And they had gotten a couple of extra tickets. And they brought their son and invited me to go along with him. It was called Success 94. It was put on by Peter Lowe International. And it, what, what it was was a business conference, a business convention, very generally speaking. And they would have different speakers from all different areas of business and industry come to speak. For example, at that time, uh, Mario Cuomo was speaking on politics. And uh, Joe Gibbs spoke from the world of sports. And a man named Zig Ziglar spoke, uh, speaking of sales. And the whole conference was about typical business things, salesmanship and goal setting and time management and all these sort of things. And all these people in business suits and, you know, from various walks of life in uh, businesses and uh, management, they attended. But I remember at the back of the hall, there was a table with a banner which read free above it. And so you can believe that I showed up at that table. And there was a crowd gathered around. And they were giving away free audio cassette tapes. And I looked at it, and it said, Zig Ziglar's Christian Testimony. Don't you know, I put that cassette tape in the player, and I played that, and I played it again and again and again, to where I could, if you started me off on the first few words of it, I could almost recite it verbatim. I was taken by it and just absolutely fascinated and mesmerized by it. But you know what's interesting to me is that I still had the blinders on. It completely escaped me that at the end of that audio tape, there was an invitation. And I did not understand that. That was a foreign concept to me. So at some point during this time, I decided to question everything I ever believed. And I asked myself, am I Catholic because I was raised Catholic? Or am I Catholic because I believe these things? And so I decided I was going to wipe the slate clean and start all the way over from scratch. I found the biggest bookstore I could find. I went to the Super Crown Bookstore in Springfield Mall, right outside of Springfield Mall in Virginia. And I spent a whole day in the religion and philosophy section. Thousands of books just pouring over titles. And one thing that I marked was very curious about this. Out of all those different books on religion, the only faith, the only books which contained a defense of the faith were Christian books. The only books which dared to claim this is the way, walk ye in it, were Christian books. All of the other titles were a history of the religion, they were a how-to, they described the rites and rituals, and that made an impression upon me. So I took a, a book by C.S. Lewis, The Case for Christianity. Okay, I didn't realize it at that time, but that's actually a condensation of his book entitled Mere Christianity, which itself is a compilation of his live radio addresses over Britain while they were being bombed during World War II. And I read that book voraciously. I highlighted it and marked it up and wrote in it and dog-eared. You've got to understand for a bookbinder to write in his book, it's almost sacrilegious. You don't know how much trouble I go through to get your books to you clean. But I devoured that book, and it appealed to me. The logic of it was beautiful to me, and it was very appealing to me. And I thought, okay, 
Christianity is true, but what's the correct form? What's the right expression of Christianity? Where do I go from here? It appealed to me because it, it followed a logical, rational, critical progression of thought. You know, it's interesting, as much as I say that I tried to wipe the slate clean, I really never did that because I really never strayed far from Christianity at all. I realize now that I had a tether that the Lord was holding to me. But I also realized later the myth of neutrality, the fallacy of neutrality, the idea that human beings really can wipe the slate clean and start over from scratch. We all have amassed a body of experience and knowledge which forms a belief system which we bring to any given evidence. And it's through that belief system that we evaluate any given evidence. So what I really wanted to find out is what is the most accurate form of Christianity? Well, many of you know, I used to work with Kenny, okay, a good friend of ours here. And uh, Kenny used to leave tracts in the men's room, okay, at work. And I took those tracts and I read them. And Kenny would whistle throughout work and he would sing hymns and he would witness to people and he would get rejected mercilessly. He would get made fun of mercilessly. And I remember two specific tracts, both by Chick, okay, the old Chick tract publications. And one of them was on salvation and the other was on creation. The one on salvation, it's a very famous, popular tract. Um, maybe it's titled something like What If. I might even still have the tract somewhere, something like What If or something like that. The other tract on creation had a picture of a, a man and a picture of a gorilla or a monkey on it. And, you know, they're really kind of goofy, cartoonish tracts. And it really could have turned me off. You know, very big, bold, black and yellow, highlighted graphics and very cartoonish graphics within them. But I read through those tracts and it made an impression upon me because the ideas therein were really eye-opening and revolutionary to me. First of all, the idea that one could have a personal relationship with the living Lord of the universe. The idea that one could know very God. That was astounding to me. The second is that one could have the assurance of his salvation. The idea that one could know that he's saved. And that was astounding to me. Also, I had never seen or heard an attack on Darwinian evolution. And the idea that there were people out there who actually believed in a literal six-day creation account in Genesis was really almost refreshing to me because I almost embraced it as, as a relief that maybe these people aren't crazy after all. Because after coming through school, one, th one question I always had in the back of my mind, again, if God is all powerful, he's all knowing, he's all present everywhere, why is a six day creation a problem? What is the problem with that for God, for the creator God of the universe? Why does he need billions of years? And I never understood that. Look, folks, either we believe this or we don't, okay? This is a package deal. So I could have really been turned off by the, by the fluff and the kind of hokey nature of those uh, tracts, but the sincerity of them and the straightforwardness of them, the material, the information really cut through and spoke volumes to me, okay? Because I've always wanted my truth served cold and hard and sharp around the edges. Just tell me the truth and let me deal with the consequences. Well, Kenny began witnessing to me and he invited me to church. And I accepted the invitation. I went with Kenny and Dana to church one Sunday. And uh, I remember being led to a trailer 
in the back and uh, sitting down in a class on a metal folding chair and there was a very young man, overly excited and eager, teaching the young singles class in his Baptist uniform. What I didn't realize then is short sleeve, white shirt and black tie, like, like the Mormon missionaries. And I remember sitting through that and really not understanding it. I remember to this day, we had a reward taped underneath the bottom of our metal folding chair as a stick of gum. That was our reward for, uh, for the uh, Sunday school class that day. I thought that was amusing. But then I entered the church. Kenny and Dana walked me in. And interestingly enough, I was greeted by the church lady. Now, if you don't know who the church lady is, if you don't know who she is in your church, every church has one, okay? And if you don't know who it is, it might be you, right? But God bless her, she was bold enough to introduce herself to me and uh, talk with me and ask me a question. She asked me a question I'd never been asked before. She said, are you a Christian? And now let me just stop you there for one moment and say that that is a foreign question to a Catholic. See, when you're Catholic, you think that you are the only game in town. As far as you know, you are in the mother church. And all these other little fringe denominations out there might as well be as satellites revolving the sun. So I didn't really understand that because why would I leave the mothership to jump in effectively what I thought was a lifeboat when all the while I didn't realize that the mothership was sinking, that it was taking on water, it was full of holes, it was flawed. You know, in order to keep it afloat, my analogy is the crew has to constantly pump water out just to, to, just to keep it afloat. But uh, I remember my answer to her when she asked me if I was a Christian, I said, well, I guess so. I mean, I'm Catholic. Because that's the only thing I could think of to answer to her. And then without, without missing a beat, she replied to me, oh, I was that. In the most condescending, patronizing, just, just dripping and seething with patrimony. She didn't even realize it. Bless her heart, right? Now, I could have taken offense to that, okay? But I think I've always been a man who doesn't easily take offense, okay? Matter of fact, uh, turn with me to Psalm 119, 165. Psalm 119, 165. And you'll probably get there before I do. I learned this from a pastor. The word of God says, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Now I wasn't saved at the time, but I was leaning in and I didn't realize it, but the Lord was drawing me to him. Okay? So I couldn't take, I could have taken offense to that. But she went on to explain, oh no, 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 no. But are you saved? Are you born again? And I didn't understand that because those words and phrases are foreign to a Catholic. You see, I'm thinking that they are just simply another denomination within the realm of Christianity. So this idea that I can know that I'm saved according to the Catholic catechism, is called the sin of presumption. Because how dare you? How arrogant that you, you claim that you know that you're saved. Okay? You know, according to the Council of Trent, Canon 9, in Catholic circles, we are called anathema. We are called accursed for what we believe. Now, probably don't have to turn there, but I, we can recite this together. If you'll turn to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and just hold on a minute while we recite this together. Ephesians uh, 2, 8, 
2, 8, and 9. So altogether, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I had read through the entire Bible as a Catholic. I had taken a sacred scripture course, okay? A, a year-long critical course in the scriptures. But that key word there is, is criticism. It was steeped in, in human criticism. And some of these things completely escaped me. So Protestants are called separated brethren, according to the Catholics. Now, of course, we're Baptists. We're not Protestant. We didn't come out of the Catholic Church. There was nothing to protest. But we are considered accursed for what we believe. Because we believe in Latin according to the three solas, sola gratiae, sola fide, sola scriptura, okay? By grace alone, through faith alone, according to scriptures alone. Because the Bible, the Word of God, the Scripture, is our sole authority for faith and practice in the church. That we don't report to the Vatican, we don't report to Nashville. We report to our pastor, and our pastor will answer to God. But, uh, you know, in Catholic circles, you're saved by faith with an admixture of works. Now, what's the problem with that? Whenever there's a contradiction between faith and works, what happens? It's always the vain traditions of men which wind up winning out in the end. And the scales are balancing one way and the other, okay? But who's holding the scales? You are. And they talk about the magisterium of the church, the teaching tradition of the church. And they elevate that to equality with the Word of God. Turn with me to uh, Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. According to the scriptures, there's nothing that we can do. There's no works that we can do in order to merit salvation. I always had this thought in my head, how is the finite to merit favor with the infinite? And how is the finite to apprehend the infinite? I could never reconcile that with myself. But uh, turn with me again to uh, Colossians 2.8. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. I'll quickly read that. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Speaking of the vain traditions of men, our rites and our rituals, <clears throat> excuse me, our works, are as filthy rags in his sight, and they're vain. Well, in the Catholic Church, there's a hierarchy. You know, they have their pope. They claim that uh, Peter was the first pope. They claim that he can speak ex cathedra, uh, that being infallible. And so that's how they claim that uh, human tradition can become equal with the Word of God, that they're speaking for God. But uh, when this lady asked me if I was saved or if I was born again, I didn't know how to answer her. And I'm not sure I really did. I might have given the classic answers. Well, I hope so. I, I think so. I mean, I'm a pretty good person. What's the classic one some people say? Well, you know, I never murdered anybody, as if the bar could be lower. 
right? You see, I thought that perhaps if my good works outweighed my bad, then I'd be able to eventually make it into heaven. You see, in the Catholic tradition, they argue for a place called purgatory in which one can be punished for a time for one's venial sins and eventually make it into heaven. A mortal sin would send you to to hell. Of course, you don't find that in the Bible. You know, I, I never knew that. But of course, in Catholic school, I was also reading a different Bible, okay? I was reading apocryphal books which have never been recognized as canon by God's people throughout the ages. So, I didn't really understand that. And in Catholic circles, Christian fundamentalists are often made fun of. You know, laughed at as, as well, those born-again Christians. Sometimes they'll, they'll call it reborn Christians. You know, I thought it very revealing when one person very close to me revealed an issue, a very concerning issue, and I said to this person, after witnessing to this person multiple times, I said, what you need to do is to get on your face before God. You need to put your face in the carpet before God and to beg him to move in your situation. And the reply came back, oh, Andrew, you don't need to do all of that. You know, because after all, we're dignified, right? We have padded kneelers. Um, you know, we, we come from a rather formal religion. But you know, years ago when Tom George uh, held a men's class back in the flamingo room, the old flamingo room, sounds like a lounge in Vegas, he would read from Daniel chapter 9, and he would teach us to cry out unto God. He would share with us from the scriptures when men cried out unto God. And there were times when he would get down, face down on the floor, and cry out unto God. And he would teach me things like that. So I learned that. But you know, I sat through that entire service that I was invited to. But now at this time, I understood that there was an invitation at the end. Now, I didn't really understand all of the preaching and teaching, but now I understood that I was expected to go forward to the front of the church and do something, say something, I don't know what. I didn't really understand it at the time, but I knew that Kenny and Dana sitting next to me, head bowed and eyes closed, I knew right then as an unsaved man that they were praying for me. And I had sat right about there, just a few rows from the front, and Kenny had conveniently placed me on the edge of the pew. (laughs) But you know what, even then, I didn't want to go up front and do something or say something just for the sake of doing or saying it when I really didn't understand it. Well... There was a time when I rode with my mother to visit a real estate agent. He was selling a house to my sister and my brother-in-law. And he asked me if I was interested. And that had never really occurred to me. I was 25 years old and single. Had no idea I could buy a house back then. But I'd gotten a promotion. I was a young, newly minted night shift foreman. And uh, I went out on my own. I entered into an agreement with him But I went out on my own on a Saturday or Sunday over the weekend. I went out house hunting. The very first time I went out house hunting, drove all around the Beltway looking at different areas. And again, I stopped at a Crown Bookstore, the Crown Bookstore in Greenbelt. And I stopped in the magazine section, and I was looking at real estate magazines. And there was another young lady there who was also looking at uh, real estate magazines. She asked me as I was, uh, you know, looking for a house, and I said, yeah, and she said she and her husband were looking too, that they were dreaming about buying a house, and he was over in the real estate section looking at the books. We struck struck up a conversation. She introduced me to him, and we struck up a conversation, and we kind of hit it off, uh, found some common ground, and decided to keep in touch, and 
What I didn't realize at the time is that the friends with whom he had introduced me were a group of Christian friends. And I don't think he even realized it at the time because neither of us were, were saved at the time. But he knew a lot of people. He was very entrepreneurial minded, always looking at different business opportunities and networking. And he, he knew a lot of people. And so this group of friends that he had met were Christians and neither one of us knew that there was really a difference between them and us. Well, there was a time when we were at a business meeting and there was a gathering there and there was a break in between. And I looked across the room and saw a short little blonde across the room. And I asked my friend's wife to introduce me to her. And that was the first time I ever met Donna Marie Twitchell. So I was still unsaved at the time. But one thing I noticed about these friends is they didn't drink, they didn't smoke, and I didn't understand that. You know, back then I always had a case of Budweiser on hand, a six pack, a couple of bottles of wine, some hard liquor. And I was never a guy who drank to get drunk. I actually liked the taste of it. And I can't say I was ever really addicted to smoking. I started, uh, I probably stopped almost as soon as I started. Both my parents were lifelong smokers. And my sister and I hated it, and we swore it off. But sure enough, in my later years, I started to pick it up. But what I didn't realize is that the Lord kept me from that. That I stopped almost as soon as I started, and that I had never gotten really addicted to it. But I remember after hanging around this group of Christian people and realizing that they didn't drink, I remember one afternoon in my apartment staring down into the empty moose head that I was holding, and I said to myself, if not audibly, I may have said this out loud to myself, you know what, I don't need this anymore. And I remember carrying around the bottle cap like Sam Malone from Cheers for weeks afterwards, thinking that I needed some token or something to remind me of what I had done. And I hadn't even really made any sort of a commitment because what I didn't realize is that the Lord had just taken this desire from me. He just took it. And from that day until this, it's about this time, 27 years ago, I've never had a sip I've never had the desire, never had a cigarette. Not that those things are going to save you, but it speaks of how the Lord was drawing me to him. Now, I'm going to wrap it up here, but I want to close by citing four specific, specific verses in Romans chapter 1. We already read from verse 15 through 25. But I want to share with you something which was really revolutionary in my apologetic, okay? And something that I've read through Romans chapter 1 how many times, and I completely missed this. And maybe you might be hearing and seeing this for the first time as well. Beginning in verse 18 through verse 22. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now, according to that passage in Romans chapter 1, who needs proof that God exists? Fools. But you know what? They already know. If you don't take anything away from this first session tonight, I want you to take away the idea that everybody knows that God exists, that everybody already knows that God exists. And I thank you for coming, and I'm going to close in prayer. 
Father, Father God, I thank you for this session tonight. I thank you for this uh, time in your word, this time to expound upon it. I thank you for fellowship with my brothers and sisters. And I pray that your name is glorified. I pray that it is profitable. I pray that souls be saved and Christians drawn to you through the exposition of the word. Now I pray as we go out to give us safety and travels, protect us, Father God, and I thank you and pray these things through the name and the blood of your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.